Okay, next I'm going to discuss the role of viscosity in an irrotational vortex, and we're going to uh, end up describing the lines of constant pressure in a vortex like this. Um, just a quick reminder, so an irrotational vortex is one where the only vorticity is concentrated at uh, r equals zero, and everywhere else there are no vortex lines. So there's one vortex line at r equals zero, that shoots straight up out of the r theta plane, right? So if we just do a quick drawing, it'd be, you got. You can imagine this is the r theta plane, and then you have one vortex line that shoots straight up out of that, and then no vortex lines anywhere else. This is different from solid body rotation. In solid body rotation, uh, I'll just do that in blue solid body rotation you would have uh, vortex lines so if we again imagine this is an r theta plane this x that I've drawn you would have vortex lines everywhere so you have a vortex line here here sorry. Um, here I mean you have vortex lines at every single point uh, throughout the entire r theta plane so this is a key difference between uh, an irrotational vortex and solid, uh, I'm sorry, and a solid state vortex, or solid body vortex, rather. So now in an irrotational vortex, uh, it's not quite as simple as the solid body situation because our stress tensor um, does not go directly to zero. It, uh, this is the viscous stress tensor that we end up with. This is the uh, equation for a viscous stress tensor. However, um, it's not overly important because although this tensor shows that viscous stress is non-zero everywhere, uh, one of the key properties of an irrotational vortex is that the viscous forces cancel on every fluid element outside of R equals zero. Right? So viscous stress is non-zero, but the viscous forces all cancel out. So what that means is our net viscous force is still zero. So uh, net viscous force, we'll call it NVF, ends up equaling zero anyway, right? So what that means is that uh, our Cauchy equation of momentum again simplifies down to the Euler equation. Oops, let's get rid of this. So our Cauchy equation of motion again simplifies down to Euler's equation. So now if you'll recall, in a um, irrotational vortex, the uh, angular velocity is equivalent to the circulation divided by 2 pi r. Right. And so all that we do differently from our previous solid body rotation example is we just plug this in for our angular velocity component and then do the exact same integral that we did before. Um, so I won't go through the exact same integration again here. Uh, it's exactly the same. It's just plugging this one value in that's different. And what we end up with is this equation which relates the uh, pressure as a function of r and z uh, and versus this p infinity component. And um, p infinity here, this just corresponds to some pressure at a point, a theoretical point, that's so far away from this central uh, vortex line that it's no longer affected by it in any capacity. And so what we end up with is uh, p is a function of r and z minus p infinity is equivalent to uh, negative rho, which is the density, times the circulation squared over 8 pi squared r squared minus rho gz, right? And now, again, just like before, if we solve for z, then we end up with this equation right here, right? So we end up with um, a function of... Uh, sorry, we solve for z, then we end up with a function of our circulation over 
eight pi r squared uh, pi squared r squared g minus um, these pressure components again over uh, rho g, right? And so what this describes, uh, where previously we had uh, parabolas or paraboloids, this time we have hyperbolas or hyperboloids, and these are second degree hyperboloids just because we're dealing with a squared component over here, uh, squared components over here. So we have these hyperboloids uh, of rotation, right? And so uh, these lines here, these ones that are going down towards Z, these are our lines of constant pressure. Yeah, so along these lines, we have constant pressure. Okay, so a key takeaway from all of this is that just because it's irritational, that does not necessarily imply the absence of viscous stresses, but it does imply this absence of net viscous forces, right? So you can have a viscous stress and still have no net viscous force. Now, also we can relate this back to um, the Bernoulli equations, the Bernoulli function, uh, because we can note that in the solid state example, the Bernoulli function is not constant for points on different streamlines because that flow is rotational. Uh, where in the irrotational example, the Bernoulli function is applicable between any two points in the flow field. 